Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Shintaro Higashi Show with Peter Yu. And today we have a very special guest. We have Jimmy Pedro in the house. Welcome, Thank you, Jimmy. buddy. Thank Thanks you for, for coming on. on. Yeah, Jimmy Pedro, for those of you who doesn't know, he's a world champion, a former world champion in judo, right? He's a two-time Olympic medalist. Is that correct? That's Did correct. That right? That's yeah. correct. And, uh, you know, we have a very long history, me and you, right, Jimmy? We go way back, buddy. We go way back. And, uh, you know, it all started with me looking at uh, the Real Judo magazine and seeing pictures of you. You remember that cover when you were like this, right? 1999. 1999 i was a little tween and i saw that and i was like who is this guy right and i would go to these tournaments and then you know so you started off in my world as like uh someone that i uh, looked up to greatly and then i had a chance to work with you you know at, at your dojo for for a year right i trained under yeah. you yeah and uh now i work for you also at fuji sports isn't that right yeah we keep it all in the family buddy yeah that's right it's been a very very uh long journey and, uh, you know, sometimes I feel a little bit, uh, you know, you're like this guy, right? So it's like a little bit, you know, oh, my God, Jimmy Page, I get to talk to this guy all the time. It's pretty cool for me. You know, people know you who you are and stuff. So, yeah. All right. Let's get started. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, that's for my listeners. And, uh, you know, tell me a little bit about uh, your judo history uh, for those people who are listening who may not know. Right. Judo so, history yeah. goes way, way, way back. I started judo in 1975. I was five years old at my dad's dojo, which was Massasoit Judo Club in PBD, Massachusetts. So it goes right. way back then, but I really got introduced to sport much like you did from the day you could walk, right? Your dad's an instructor. Yeah. You're always at the dojo. You're always around the sport. So that's when I got started. Um, for me, it, you know, judo wasn't something that I loved when I was a kid. It was a place that I went that had lots of other kids and we played all kinds of other games. But the judo training under my father was really, really hard, right? It was, oh, yeah. you know, it was demanding. He, he, he trained everybody's butt off. He wanted to only produce champions. And so the training was grueling and I really didn't like it. Uh, not to say the hardness of the training, but just the whole competitive environment and being pushed to the limit all the time. It wasn't something I loved as a little kid. Um, but, mm. you know, as I got older, I started getting better. And when I was in my teens, I realized I had a lot of potential. And that's when I took training, you know, very, very seriously and ended up making my first Olympic team in 1992. Uh, I wow. was my my dad's first student ever to make the Olympics. So that was a yeah. big moment for us as a Huge family deal. and, yeah. you know, as my dad as a coach. And then, you know, having not medaled in 92 at the Olympics, I was I was crushed. I was devastated. It was something that I had, you know, wanted to do my entire life and had dedicated my entire life to. And I felt like a failure after 92 because I didn't step yeah. up on the podium, uh, which led me to pursue the 96 Olympics, which I trained for more years. I lived in Japan for six months in preparation for those games and ended up winning my first Olympic medal. And, you know, that was that was truly a, a dream come true because it's something yeah. you, you've always pictured is stepping up on the Olympic podium. And when I finally got to do it, it made all the training, all the blood, all the tears, all the sacrifices it made it all worth it, and it was special. Yeah, in Atlanta, um, right, too? It's yes. like an American soil and all that. So I remember watching that as a kid, man. It's like, oh, That man. was the best time ever. Like, yeah. You know, when, you went, when you win an Olympic medal in your home country and the entire yeah. crowd at the time, I think it was 7,500 people you know, yeah. in the crowd, were behind you chanting, USA, USA. It yeah. Was, it was right. electric. It was really electric. And beating a Brazilian, throwing him free pwn for the bronze medal was – yeah, you know, it couldn't have finished a better way, really. So nice, nice. There was that. Then you know, four more years of you know struggle and training and sacrifice. I had three kids at the time. Oof. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I was reign world champion in '99. Going into the 2000 Olympics, I'm going to be America's first ever gold medalist. Yeah. Uh, I was in. I was in all the magazines, Sports Illustrated, ESPN, like lots right. of news coverage. Went to the Olympics and just was flat, just overtrained. Just a flat mm. performance. Um, it was a little bit of a weird tournament. Uh, the The Olympics didn't actually start until 3 p.m. in the afternoon, yeah. you know, because of TV time. So it was like it took me totally out of my normal routine. No excuses, but when you're expected to win and you come home finishing fifth, you're yeah. just crushed, devastated. So, mm. you know, bad Olympics in Sydney, very upset about the performance, and then decide after two years leave of absence that I got to do it one more time, which is Athens. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and then the Athens Olympics comes and, you know, I finish on the podium again. I can end my career on a high note and feel like I was I was a winner in the end. And it was it was a special career. But, yeah, 
you know, I remember watching uh, Fury on the Mat. Do you remember? I mean, I'm sure you remember it, but I remember watching that, and that was a big moment uh, when you made that comeback. It was like, hey, Marie, I'm going to go for it again. You know, I know we have all these kids, and my <laughs> neck is banged up, but I'm going to go for it. You know, and I was like, I was remember watching that, like, man, oh my god, you know. Yeah, Good. yeah. That me and yeah. my one of my buddies. I used to work at Monster.com, and my buddy was in the uh, video department. He helped me pull together all my old videotapes and all my yeah, old stuff, love put that. them on DVD, and then helped me create that film. Yeah, dude, I remember so many of the watching it as a kid, man. There's so many tidbits of it. It's like uh, I remember one of the things was like, hey, man, like I've never lost, you know, until I was like nine years old or something. And the first time I've ever lost it, I've had all these wins. I was completely undefeated. I was absolute savage. I had the was it the half Nelson turnover that you ran through all the kids with? Yeah, right. And then he was like, and then, I mean, I, and then, and then it happened, you know, and I remember thinking, you know, like that, like, I don't know why it le- left such a lasting impression on me. It, you, you know, know though, it, I was 11 years old. I had never lost a judo tournament from, uh, I said nine, from sorry, six yeah, to 11. 11. I won every Jesus. junior national championships, every tournament my dad ever took me to like, how many was matches amazing, was yeah. that? That must've been crazy. We, we went to everything. So hundreds, I, I don't thousands, even, I don't even yeah. know. Oh, no. So but regardless I had never dealt with a loss before. And I had a father who every time I saw any of his students lose, I always saw him like, you know, yelling at the kids and telling them what they did wrong. And he was loud. He's aggressive. Yeah, yeah. He's abrasive. I've taken so that I, from your father too. Yeah. I remember that. I never <laughs> wanted to be the guy on the receiving end of that. So I always won on the mat. So I didn't yeah. have to get my dad mad at me. Right. I thought he was going to be angry. So when I lost that fight, I just collapsed on the mat. I just fell. You know, when the hand went up, it was a split decision. They gave the the match to the other kid. I didn't know how to deal with it. I just emotionally just fell on the ground crying. Yeah, and oh, I think Lord. at the time that's when my dad realized, like, man, this kid's under a lot of pressure. Like, I yes. can't believe it's affected at him 11. in this way. Jesus, like, he had to yeah. carry me off the mat, pick me up, carry me off the mat, take me home, and tell me it was okay. Yeah, you know, it, it was a tough lesson. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Man, that must have been tough doing all that stuff as a kid, right? I mean, did you guys have a lot of good stuff in between too? Like, hey, you know, uh, sometimes if I won a tournament with Tayatoshi, like he'd buy me ice cream or were there like soft moments like that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Every, yeah. Like for us, the, the junior nationals in judo was the was the one week we took for vacation as a family. So wherever oh, yeah. the junior nationals was, we tried to do something fun in the town afterwards you know, so we went to like Knott's Berry Farms and we went to Six Flags. And yeah. you know, after the tournament, my dad always wanted to do something celebratory so that it wasn't just about sport. It was about, you know, sightseeing and nice. you know visiting other places and doing some fun stuff. Would it be like at the end of the three? Because they usually had the three, right? So it was like a triple crown situation back in the day. Do you remember that? It was like the USJA. Well, back USJA, in the day for yeah. me, it was just the JA Nationals and the JF Nationals. USA Judo oh. didn't have like a, oh, a oh, oh, oh. you know, they didn't exist. Yeah. It was the, the JF was the biggest Nationals. In and the summer. JA was another national. So, yeah. Nice. We used to go to both. Wow. We tried to go to both. USJA Nationals and USJF. Nice, yeah. nice. So you had this very, very illustrious career, and then eventually you transitioned into coaching. I know you have a very successful dojo. I took part in that for, for a long time. I used to visit you. I went to all your camps, right? And then I was training there. I even lived in your house, right? The athlete yeah. house. That was, yeah. a, that was a great time in my life. Thank you for having me there. Oh, you're you know, um, Yeah, it was great. A lot of the stuff that you, know, you preach, I, I lived it, right? I was there. Um, after the competition career, now you transition to the coaching side. How was that transition? Like, did you love it? I mean, I know you've already produced a lot of champions and stuff. Like, is it the same fields, the same highs, or is it a little different? Uh, so it's it's definitely, you know, it's definitely different, right? I mean, when you're an athlete, when you're an athlete, then when you win, everything is because of what you've done, right? You've earned the right to win. Mm. As a coach, you're relying on your athletes to yeah. perform. So yeah. you're more of a puppet master. You're trying to get the most out of your athletes, mm. but you're not the one that directly, you know, affects whether you win or lose. Like you help yeah. in the process. You're part of that process. You prepare them mentally, you prepare them physically. At the end of the day, they have to execute. And so that's, that's where it gets tough when, especially when they don't follow directions or they don't do things the way you want them yeah. to do, it gets frustrating because... If they if they competed the right way, they probably would have won that match, you know. So it's hard to live with those mistakes. But you know, yeah, as a coach, it, it 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 takes um it takes more patience, you know. Yeah, it really you does. Can't just, yeah, you can't yeah. just put your head through the wall and do it because that's what you do for yourself. You got to figure out a way to reach this person, motivate them, encourage yeah. them, 
you know, true. show them, uh, teach them, reinforce it. Like it's, yep. it takes yep. a lot longer as a coach to get things done. Yeah. I'll never forget, man. I was, uh, you know, I know you preached the over under pass. I know you're a master at that. And I think you, you were the beginner of, you know, the starting guy with over under, you were doing over under pass before it was cool. Right. Because that's the pass that doesn't prevent the person from turtling up. And it's an effective pass in judo. Right. Right. Yeah. And I remember, uh, you know, at a tournament, guy goes for a sumi or something. And you're like, split the legs. And then I was like, ah, oh, man, I don't know if I'm going to get it. <laughs> like, I might get Sankaku. And I like kind of like didn't go for it. Guy turned out. You're like, Jesus. And I remember that. So I, I saw the frustration in your eye then. And, you know, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, that's, uh, you know. Uh, you know, it's funny is that that over underpass, I started doing that back in like 1988. So you're talking about jujitsu didn't even come to this country until the 90s, yeah. you know, till the 90s after the UFC, you know, the first UFC and stuff like that. So I've been doing that stuff way before, you know, it was really popular. So is that something that you came up with? Like, uh, I mean, people have done over underpass before, I'm sure. But is that yeah. something that you're like, this pass is the one that works in judo? This is the one because I'm locking in the hips with some, you know, the isometric strength and this and that and immobilizing. And then I climb up the body for the pin. Like, is that something? Because, you know, I know you wrestled in college, but like, uh, you know, that's not a wrestling move. No. Right. And that's specifically no. a pass that's like the best for judo that's sort of gotten adopted and getting a lot of popularity now in BJJ. So like what made you adopt that into your system? Like why? Why over who taught? Maybe someone taught it to you. Yeah. I, came up believe, with your own. I, I learned it at a camp. I learned it at a training camp. I was at a training camp at Pat Burris's place in Oklahoma. I think I was 16, 17 years old. Ed yeah. Liddy was there. Kevin Asano came. There was a lot of top players in the country yeah. that went to that camp. I was just a yeah. young teenager. And we're, they were teaching all different types of moves. And that was one of the moves that they taught at the camp. And then I just learned it and then decided that I was going to perfect it and learn like yeah. all the little nuances of how to like you know, if they react this way, then you do this. And it, it just became my move. And then, you yeah. know, I had the luxury of going overseas everywhere. And in Europe, you know, a lot of the judoka have good ground game and they, they play from their back. They play from the guard position. So I had a lot of opportunities to perfect that pass when I was traveling internationally and got used to the different reactions I would see and then just learned how to master it. Nice, nice. Same with the gripping too, right? Like, uh, cause it wasn't really explicitly taught for a very long time. And I remember you talking about it in, in a practice that I was at, they were saying like the Japanese put two hands on, they don't grip fight, they adjust for position and they go and they're just super, super skilled in that area. It's like the best strategy for me, for you was to, you know, not let them get there in the first place. So I developed a system, this gripping system, right? Was that something that was explicitly taught to you by your father? Or is that something that you kind of like little by little figured out on the, on your way to the no see my dad was a my dad was a guy that started judo when he was 19 years old so he was way behind the eight ball and everybody else that he was competing against he was trying to go to the olympics and gripping was something that was introduced to him you know in his early 20s and he yeah. realized that if he he learned how to grip fight properly he could beat those technicians that have been doing judo since they were five or six years old because it's hard to get a natural feel for the sport when you start so late, like you're never going to be instinctually as good as somebody who starts when they're a kid. So my dad learned that gripping was a quick way to get good fast. And what mm. he did is his school is, and since I was at his school, since a young boy, he taught gripping to all of our students. Yeah. And in fact, there was a period of time at my academy where, or my dad's academy, where every student was taught left-handed judo. We didn't have a single righty in the dojo. Everybody was left-handed and he made everybody grip fight. So, being the youngest, smallest kid in my dad's dojo for years and years and years, I actually learned how to grip fight against bigger, better people my entire life. Yeah. So it got to the point when I was like 16, 17 years old, I could compete against any left-sided judo player in the world. It, it really didn't matter how good they were because I was so skilled at gripping that yeah. I could stay with anybody. I couldn't throw them. My technique wasn't as good, but I was able to stay in the fight. And, mm. uh, and then later on in my yeah. career, I got... You know, any lefty that I fought in the world, I don't care if it was Qualmals, I don't care if it was Udo, U, you know, um, yeah. Martin Schmidt from Germany, Udo Qualmals, any lefty that I fought, I pretty much beat them all. Yeah. You know, that's so, amazing. Yeah. Uh, but on the flip side of that, I struggled with righties for a while, you know, when I was young, up and coming, mm. and I had to learn how to adapt the strategy to, to compete against opposite sided players. But Interesting. it's something that was instilled in me from a young age, and gripping is a big part of the American judo success. So 
whether it's Ronda Rousey, whether it's Travis Stevens, yeah. whether it's Kayla Harrison, myself, you know, even the ones that made the Olympic team, maybe didn't medal, but had a really good career and they won mm-hmm. a lot of international fights, gripping played a huge role in their success. And that's yeah, very that's important sure. to the system yeah. of judo we're trying to teach here in America. Because yeah. although the Japanese, you say, don't grip, you'd be surprised because of how long they've done it instinctually. They know how to position their hands. Yes. They know how to take inside grip. They know how to nullify your sleeve. They don't have a system that they teach. It just comes through doing so many hours of training and so many years of training. They do it really well. And what's funny is that Ayumi Tanimoto came to my dojo for about a month to uh, just you know sightsee and help out and, and yeah. whatever. And we were going over gripping and she saw the concept and she was like, wow, okay, let me show me this. And I was teaching her. And then I said, I grabbed her sleeve and I said, please break this sleeve grip. And without even ever being taught specifically, yeah. she took her hand, she brought it up and used her, her elbow to shorten the gi. She took her hand inside, which gave her some pressure on the elbow, and she ripped it out. Just like we would rip out how we teach athletes to rip out the sleeve, she did yeah. it instinctually just because that's how to break a grip. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think they're not new moves, but they're moves that we teach in sequence so that they're yeah. easy to understand and they're easy to replicate, and therefore it's a gripping system. Yeah, and you know, that that con- like really connects with your judo system too. Like, because I remember thinking like, uh, you know, oh man, like, you know, gripping, gripping, then you can't outgrip the guy, you're losing in position, and now you kind of start panicking and you go for like a bad tomonage or sumigaeshi because you're like, oh man, I can't throw this person. This guy's about to throw me tayo. And then you go to your back and now all of a sudden you're passing him over under, right? So like, <laughs> boy, is that like synergy like really tight, you know? I remember thinking that. Not to yeah. get too technical about the judo side of stuff, but you know, I, I'm kind of a nerd, and I'm sure if people are listening to this, yeah, they like it too. I, dude, I will never forget, man, getting uh, working out with you one night. Like you came in, you're like, "Hey, Higashi, let's go," and then, you know, you had the post right because you're left, I'm right, and you had the post on the collar hand, and then I'm on the outside, and I tried to circle on the inside, and then you closed it. You took two steps and then hit me with a tayo. But the thing is, you didn't have my sleeve yet. So like as we're moving, right, I circled my hand in. You took two steps. I had no hands on. You caught my sleeve and hit me tie up. You remember that? I don't. Probably don't. Yeah, probably don't. But <laughs> it, it was like I remember that. I was like, holy moly, if, you know, if you could do that, right? That's that the idea, that you specifically right? That, drilled? I mean, that's the idea is to, is to always keep inside position. And when your opponent gives up position, you take advantage, yeah. right? So yeah. yeah, it's all it is part of the system, but that's obviously a, a high level advanced feel you have to get for the sport. Is that something that you explicitly drilled? Yes, Moving. it's something mm-hmm. I drill. It's something I teach yeah. to our students how to close that elbow so the person can't come inside. Yeah. You force them back out, and then you take you know take good control. And listen, yeah. I learned it when I was in Japan. I mean, how do you th- yeah. you know when I was in Japan, I was trying to figure out how to get inside, and I couldn't. And I saw yeah. what they were doing, and so I. You know, I trained it, I learned it, and, and you just pick up things. You know, as a as a judoka, you have to be constantly learning, and you have to mm, always have your true. eyes open. You have to have your yeah. eyes open and understand what's going on, and yeah. then figure it out, ask questions, and then make it part of your game. Nice, nice. Is there anybody on the international roster now from the U.S. that is sort of like you're watching from the side and you're like, man, that has that's good judo? I know, you know, we only qualify two Olympians, correct? Yeah. Right. To Is date, it was Angie Delgado qualified directly for the Olympics, and uh, Colton Brown took the uh, wild card slot at the Olympics. Uh, nice. So we have two definitely going to Tokyo, but uh, Nafeli Papadakis still has a chance because she's you have to be top 18 in the world to go to the Olympics. She's ranked now 19, so she's out of the qualification. But from what I understand, there's a girl from Slovenia in that division that's currently pregnant who's mm. probably going to pull out of the games, and if so... Yeah. Nefeli will get a chance to go. Nice. So that sounds good. Yeah. yeah. So let's uh, explain to our listeners about like how does one go about qualifying for the Olympics? I know they change it every couple of years, but this specific Olympic cycle, which I assume they're going to keep doing this system, right? It's hard to say. It, it, you know, in 2016, uh, there was the top 22 men got to go to the games yeah. and the top 14 women. That's how it was in 2016. Yeah. In 20, uh, 2020, they changed it to be the top 18, whether you're a male or a female. So mm. eight, the best 18 men in each weight and the best 18 women in each weight from different countries. It's not you, you can't send more than one from each country. 
So it's really not the top 18 in the world. Usually they go down yeah. to about 25 to 30 to get rid of the, the repeat countries. But So it's gotcha. the top 18 men and women is the way it is for 2020. And the so, way you qualify. Yeah. yeah. So it's okay. So not sorry to interrupt you, but like if you're number one and you're from Japan, number two, three, four, five is from Japan, number six is from Russia, then two to five gets pushed to the side, six goes up to two, right? Correct. Still the same structure? Correct. Yes, exactly. Nice. So 18 rank per country per weight class, essentially. No, 18 ranked per weight class. So per weight class, The best 18 yeah. per weight class from different countries. Yes, 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 that's correct. Wow. And then how does the wild card work now? So the wild card is given – so there's the way the IJF has set it up is they want, they want representation from every country in the Olympic Games. So mm-hmm. every national Olympic committee, national governing body – so – France, you know, Mauritius, uh, Cuba, Brazil, they make sure that there's one rep- at least one representative from that country at the Olympic Games. Mm. So every country gets one slot. It's called the wild card slot. So yeah. if you have nobody that directly qualifies from your country in the top 18, Jamaica gets to send one person. They get to pick their best person to go to the Olympics. Oh, interesting. You know, so I have to in move the United to Antarctica. States. Is that, is United, that right? What's that? I have to move to Antarctica, right? I'm not sure they actually have an official <laughs> judo program there, Shintaro. You might, <laughs> but uh, that's the idea. Yes, um, and then if you're from a country that qualifies five people, you get to have one wild card. If you have 15 people, you still get one wild card. You always have one extra from your country who is the highest point gatherer. They have to be the person that gets the most international points from your country. That person mm. gets the continental quota for that country. Nice. Can you explain so, a little bit about the international point system? It changes. It's changed a lot. And even it, you know, between uh, they extended it one more year from 2020 to 2021, they extended it another year and they even changed the points from that mm. in 2021, the points change again. So it's constantly evolving, but essentially they take the hardest tournaments, the world championships, the world masters, and they give the most points to that event. If you win the world championships, now you get 2000 points. Two thousand points. Wow! If you win like a Grand Slam tournament, like Tokyo would be a Grand Slam. Um, Paris is a Grand Slam. Those Grand Grand Slams, correct? Right now there are. Yeah, there was one in Russia as well. So the four Grand Slam events, you get like a thousand points if you win, and then Grand Prix they have seven hundred points for gold, and you know there's a point total for gold, silver, and bronze at every one of those leveled events, and then they have. it starts with the World Championships, the Olympic Games is the most points, the World Championships, the World Masters, then your four Grand Slams. Then there's about 20 Grand Prix events uh, around the world, and those are on every continent pretty much, the Grand Prix. Mm. And then they have a next level lower, which is the Continental Cups, which wow. are you know, yeah. in a lot of different countries. And those are really That's good right. development tournaments, low-level tournaments to kind of like test out your skills at the international scene. Yeah. The entire world doesn't go. It's pretty much... You know, your continent people go to those events, not necessarily going to get people from Japan and the Americas competing together, but most of the South American countries go to the Continental Cups that are in the northern southern, southern hemisphere. So you get up, you add up your best five, your best five uh, points from your best five point that you earned at any of those competitions. Plus, you get either the World Championships or the uh, Pan Am Championships as a sixth point tournament. And they take oh, your best six results gotcha, from 2020. Gotcha. Well, now it's 2021. Your best six results from 2021, and then your best six results from 2020 uh, add up together to to qualify for the Olympic Games. Nice. So what is like the bare minimum in terms of points to make it on average, on average? It varies by division, but it's around 2,000 points is what you need. You know, around between 2,000 and, and, you know, 3,000, I would say, will get, get you to the Olympics. Do you like this system over the old system where you had to qualify the weight in the Pan Americans and then win the national qualifier, the national trials? Do you remember? That? That's probably like 2000. I can't even remember when, but like 2008. So, I mean, back in my day, you just have to yeah. be the best person in your country and you got to go to the Olympics. So if you were the best American, you didn't have to you didn't have to win on the international stage. You just had to win the U.S. trials and you oh, got wow. to go to the Olympic Games. Yeah. But because they're trying because more and more sports are are entering the Olympics, right? There's all these new sports, karate's a new sport, skateboarding's mm-hmm. a new sport. All these new sports that get introduced to the Olympics, 
every four years, the number of athletes keeps growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And so what they're trying to do is control the amount of athletes to go to the Olympics and the way or limit it. And the way they do that is they have to cut back with the existing sports. Like, hey, Judo, you, you can't bring a thousand people to the Olympics. You can only bring 600. And then you, oh. the sport of Judo then has to figure out how they're going to allocate and how they're going to make 600, the best 600 athletes get to the game. So I think now it's, it's, it's probably the most fair because it's, it is truly global. You, qual- you can qualify globally against the rest of the people in the world. The part that I struggle the most with is that, you know, some of the best athletes still don't get to compete in the Olympics, right? Mm. Because look at 66 kilos Japan, right? You have Maruyama, who's who's world champion, and you have Abe, who's world yeah. champion. They're number one, two, one and two in the world without question in that weight yeah. class, and one of them doesn't get to go. So yeah, I sure. would like the system to be a little bit, I mean, the way I think I would recommend changing is that, you know, you could have a maximum of two people for a specific country, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. in a specific weight class in an instance where you have somebody who's world champion and someone who's also world champion in different years, you know, they, they would get an automatic bid. One of them would get an automatic bid and the other one would have to qualify on the roster. And if they do, then both of them get to go. Um, but also, if you look at the weight categories themselves, like every time you go to an IGF event, they show you how many people are in the tournament. And when you look at 48 kilos and you look at 60 kilos, those yeah. are, those as well as the heavyweights, you know, the plus hundreds and plus 78s, the number of people that compete in those events is normally, let's say, 20 to 30. Yeah. All right. If 20 or 30 competitors on the ends, in the middle, it starts to go like this. So yeah. 73 and 81 kilos, you have normally like 60 to 80 people. So you have like two to three times as many people in the in the main you know common weight yeah. categories 73 81 90 those are the biggest divisions same on the women's side you know 57 63 are the most common weight classes so they they yeah. have the most competitors to me it would make sense that you know you'd only get 10 slots at 60 and maybe 10 slots at a at the heavyweight division but the 81s and 73s the top 20 would qualify because mm. if you look at the percentages a lot more people are competing That's in true. those divisions it's Definitely. You know, it's tougher to qualify in those divisions. Yeah. Oh, that would definitely make it a little bit more fair, right? Right. It would. Yeah. So, so how anyway. does uh, the U.S. team look this year? I mean, yeah, I know I mean, Colton and Angie, but, uh, you know, for our listeners, maybe they, right, let's give like a little bit of a sure. run on how they do. It's like an Olympic countdown event also, <laughs> collaboration with Fuji, so, right? Yeah, they're, I mean, they're both, uh, they're both athletes that I've worked closely with. I mean, Angie and Colton were both on the 2016 Olympic team. Um, you know, I've worked personally with both of those athletes. They've spent some time here at my training center. Um, they're both seasoned competitors. They've been around for a long time now. I mean, Angie was winning the, I think it was 2012 or around there, 2012. She won the Grand Prix in the United States when it was in Florida. So she's been at a high level now for, you know, eight to 10 years. Colton's been around for a long time. He's bigger, he's stronger, he's more experienced, he's more professional in his approach. He's doing everything he can, strength and conditioning wise, to give himself the best chance at the games. And you know, he's beaten some good players, as has Angie. Um, they haven't won at the biggest stage yet. You know, they haven't won at the Olympics. They haven't won at the World Championships. I don't think either one is placed at the Grand Slam level events, the Tokyos, mm-hmm. the Parises, when the best in the world are there. But you know, in order to win at the Olympics, you just you have to be there, right? You don't have a shot if you didn't qualify. True. Uh, so they're both in the Olympic Games. Second, they've already been to an Olympics once. So they're not going to be as starstruck. They're not going to be as nervous. They're more experienced. And the more comfortable you are competing, the better you're going to do. Mm. You know. Um, on top of that, you know, they've both had a lot of events where they've competed at the highest level and they've been able to train with everybody they're going to compete against. So they've got, you know, they're, they're not wowed by the people. They're in the game. And at the Olympics, it's a special event because most of the top guys feel a lot of pressure and they mm. don't necessarily always perform well. Whereas the young, fearless competitors that just go yeah. out there and fight end up doing really, really well. So mm. I'm looking forward to maybe, you know, a top seven from Angie, a top seven from Colton. That would be a really good result for both of them. Yeah, that'd both be great. make it to that second stage where you get to compete in front of the, you know, the big crowds and you got the media yeah. on you. I think depending on the draw, it's tough at the Olympics now because they seed the top eight athletes. So yeah. both both Angie and Colton are going to have to beat a top eight ranked person in the world to make it to that top seven. 
Not saying yeah. it's not po- it not it's it's not possible, but it's going to be a challenge. And you yeah, know, whereas definitely. back in back in the when I was competing, there were no seeds. You mm-hmm. know, you could compete against you could be world champion, you could compete against the Olympic champion first round. You know, yeah. there were no seeds, yeah. which yeah, you could get really lucky with a draw. Correct. So back then, yeah. you know, you had a chance to get three or four wins under your belt with mediocre players. Maybe you got in a good quarter, and now you're mm. right to the top seven because you had an easy easy path to get there. So. It's a tighter road than it ever was before, but, you know, they're both very experienced. They both earned the right to be there. You know, they're capable of, of having a great day, then they're capable of that, you know, top seven being in the money. Nice. So a lot of the conversations I, I've been having with a lot of people surrounding the Olympics is people are saying, hey, did you hear about the, the they released the American Olympic team for the judo? And this this is the hard question, right? Like, we, Americans only qualified two athletes you know it's like how is that possible like americans have great athletes it's we're supposed to be good at athletics like why why is this possible and i'm trying to explain you know and i'm giving my sort of two cents on this stuff like what is your take on that i know this is a little bit more of a difficult question but i'm sure you have some very insightful thing to say about that well there's a number of reasons you know the rest of the world is very professional in its approach to judo there's, there's, you're competing against countries with huge budgets. Now, we're talking budgets of 10 to $20 million per year that you're putting into their judo programs. They have yeah. professional paid staff at every level. The na- you know, senior national coaches, assistant national coaches that are traveling with the team all around the world at every camp, every event. Um, they're paying their athletes money to do the sport. You know, yeah. And that, that's at the, the senior level, the junior level, and the cadet level. Athletes are being paid, coaches are being paid, and it's a professional business. The only thing that coach does is train athletes to do judo. That's their job. Mm-hmm. And that's Japan, that's Russia, that's France, that's Germany, that's every country in the, in, in the world does that. America doesn't do that. We don't, we don't have a professional paid coach right now in this country who makes a living coaching athletes. We give, we give some coaches a stipend. We give them a thousand bucks. Hey, go on this trip to Japan for a week. Take off of work for a week and go on this trip for, it will give you a thousand bucks. How do you feed a family on a thousand dollars? You can't. How do you dedicate a hundred percent of your time to judo when you're not Mm -hmm. being paid to do it? You can't, you have to have another job. And therefore all of our coaches, all of our staff have other jobs they're doing from nine to five or whatever they work. And then afterwards they're trying to help coach athletes. So we don't have a centralized training center where everybody's training together. We don't have a national staff that dedicates 100% of their time to coaching at the highest level. And forget about the junior level and the cadet level. We have zero coaches that are being paid to do any of that work. Whereas the rest of the world is putting money into their athletes, into their program. So our athletes are falling farther and farther behind and they're getting bigger and stronger and more Mm -hmm. developed. We're not. So... It's the infrastructure. It's the lack of resources that we have. Um, you know, and it's also right now very expensive for athletes to pursue the Olympic dream. You know, yeah, the Olympic Committee is. only gives us a limited budget. They want yeah. us to spend that money on athletes that are going to potential to win medals. So all the money has to be earmarked towards Angie and Colton and you know other others that have a chance to to make the team and potentially win medals. We can't spend the money on the development side. So there's, there's no way we can trickle that money down and give it to the young kids. So, yeah. you know, for a, a parent to, to say, I want my kid to go to the Olympics in judo. Okay, great. If you're ready to spend $50,000 per year, if you have that money to spend, mm-hmm. you can help get them there. But if you don't have 50000 to spend sending them around the world, forget about it. And at the yeah. end of the rainbow, when they do win, right now we have nothing for them, right? Kayla had to go to MMA and make her living from you know, punching and beating up girls, right? That's how she makes her living. She couldn't make her living anymore in judo. So there was no path for her to be a judo professional. And I'm I'm actually working with USA Judo right now on a plan to help professionalize, you know, coaches in this country, athletes in this country, the business in this country. Uh, And and hopefully it's going to be a long path, but hopefully we can get there because 2028 is right around the corner. We're seven years away from having a full team compete at the Olympic Games. In Los Angeles, we're going to get, you know, seven men, seven women, and a combined team on the mat. So it's an exciting time because now the kids have a chance to make the Olympics. It's going to be easier than ever before. You just got to be the best person in the States to get there. 
Ah, well, so no world ranking list, no none of that. It doesn't apply to the host country at all. No. Host country gets come out one of retirement, person no Jimmy. matter what. What's that? You got to heal up that knee and get, come out of retirement. I'm ready, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if I could do it, I would. I love it so much. Yeah. Like, there's no greater feeling than being on the mat and, like, putting yeah, it all the on the line and, and, yeah. and trying to win, you know? You, out of everybody, though, it's like, you know, come up with a new system. Gripping, uh, Tomoinage Sumi, uh, Newanza based, right? Like, I yeah. mean, right? you could probably do it, you know? I could. Right? Listen, I, there's no way I'd hang with the top people. But I could. I, get, I bet you there's a couple guys out there I'd beat. Oh, 100%. <laughs> From the U.S., right? Oh, I no, mean, no, I'm talking internationally. Internationally. Yeah. <laughs> no, U.S. not even a question. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh man so what are some of these main points for the this system that you're working on for the u.s judo development like are you allowed to share some of that or it's a it's really a recent proposal we've made i mean it starts with the american judo system we have travis and i started the usa judo.com website and that's to teach the american judo system to anybody that wants to learn it It could be a jiu-jitsu guy that yeah. wants to learn how to do judo it could be a, a guy at home who has no access to a local dojo that wants to learn online you know, and wants to be introduced to judo and have a systematic way to learn it. Um, it could be a high high level judoka or a you know a young up and coming kid who's fourteen that you know wants to learn technique the right way and reinforce the the right drills. So it starts with the American judo system as a content platform to educate the country to elevate the level of judo in this nation by having an mm. online resource twenty four hours yeah. a day, seven days a week. They have access to judo and. Yeah how to do specific techniques because that's a problem we don't have access to coaching in this country you know no, for a lot of people yeah. so that's the start the idea is to bring in other coaches from around the nation other top coaches put mm. them on this platform as well so that we have every topic covered every technique covered in a systematic way and then eventually break it down so we have you know here's how the toddlers should learn judo here's how the kids should learn judo here's the recreational adult judo here's yeah. you know for every level at every age we have an online learning platform that's that's step one step two is to then create uh camps and clinics around the country where you take the american judo system all the techniques and you get you know feet on the street like boots on the ground where you take your top coaches and you bring them to the local community and you're teaching the coaches and the athletes at bigger training clinics where you're teaching judo so that they can then use that knowledge to, to train their students and teach their students. Again, elevating the game in this country, creating mm. excitement about the sport, bringing the nation together at these camps and clinics. Everybody has a thirst for knowledge. Everybody wants to get better. Right yeah. now, they don't know where to go or how to get it. So we want to have like eventually you know, have 50 camps in this country going on. Wow. You know, 50 different training camps, different coaching yeah. clinics, certifications for coaches, you know, and then yeah. at those camps and clinics, you're you're inspiring the next generation to stay in judo because the clinic is being run by an Olympian. So they're yep. getting a see, touch and feel the Angie Delgado's, the Colton Browns, etc. Right. Yep. They're teaching the best judo. They're signing autographs. They're taking pictures and they're they're teaching good stuff to the kids. At the same time, you're elevating all of the senseis in the area and teaching them world-class judo, which hasn't yeah. been done in a long time in this country. Mm. It's all being funded by the organization or by donations and in the community is funding this effort so we can pay the coaches to coach yeah. those clinics, which puts money in, in the pockets of the Olympians and keeps them in the sport longer. Um, you know, Plus, it's a chance to identify young talent and invite them to the national training camps which then brings all the best kids in the country together, which then helps with development, eventually have a national training center where they can all go and train together and live and be mm. full-time athletes, get enough money in the system where you're paying a staff to be there with them and travel with them so that they have a fighting chance against the rest of the world, you know, who does have that staff, um, you know, and then creating careers, you know, the, the goal is to create yeah. careers for people in judo. So, you know, whether you want to be a professional coach, whether you want to go around the country giving certifications and teaching people how to, you know, we're going to, we want to pay these people to do those jobs mm -hmm. and then maybe eventually help Olympians after retirement open dojos. I own oh, a mat yeah, company. A we've got yeah. a gi company. You yeah. know, we've got, we've got the, a curriculum of how to do it. We know how to, uh, the billing system. We've got all the systems in place to run a successful dojo. Well, why not 
<clears throat> why, why can't the organization take a stake in the business? All right, Colton mm-hmm. Brown, you want to go open a dojo? If that's what yeah. you want to do for a living? Yeah. Here's I think Colton we'll do. does want to open a dojo. Oh, there you go. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll help you with the lease. We'll help you sign the lease. We'll help you with the seed money. You know, we'll help mm. you with the curriculum, the mats. We'll set it all up. We'll help oh, you yeah. market it. And then you run it. You know, you nice. get a couple other people to help you. And then as the money comes in, you, you get a set salary until all, you know, everything gets paid back to, you know, the investments paid back. And then he's off and running and maybe the organization keeps a percentage of profits, you know, forever because it's like a, a franchise that we help start. Then we yes. do it again with yes, another yes, athlete. Yes. Do it another, And now we start growing dojos in America where... People that want to do judo full time can do judo full time. They make money yes. in judo fanatics. Yeah. They yep. make money from the American judo system teaching. They're making money yeah. teaching camps and clinics. They run in their own dojo. Well, we can get to that level. Where we've got you know twenty to fifty of those going on. Now we're going to have a sport in this country. Wow, that's exciting. That's a great idea. I'm uh, very optimistic for the future. You know, if things can fall into place and then it could take off. Right? That's very exciting. And then so the sights is set 2028. Is that right? 2028, baby. We we've got it. We're under the gun right now. We've we've got to come together as a country. We the presentation we put together was uh, one team, one dream. One team, one, team, one, one dream. dream. Yeah. This entire judo community needs to come together for one cause. The Olympics mm. are coming to America. We're gonna have a team. We're gonna have a team on the mat that can compete. And we yeah. want to impress the world. One team, one dream. One Love team, it. one dream. Let's go. Yeah. Can we do a T-shirt, a Fuji T-shirt? One team, one dream. Let's go. I'll sell it to my international distributors, right? Because that's my division, <laughs> right, Jimmy? Yes. Shitaro we'll is heading up the international yeah. distri- distribution of uh, Fuji Sports. He's doing a great job making connections yeah. around the world. We're going to take – it's not about the brand. It's about <laughs> judo in this country, right? Like yeah. judo in yeah. this country has got to be – I'm passionate about judo. If it doesn't come across in oh, the way yeah, I speak, yeah. I don't know. But uh, I, I really want it to be successful. I think it, it's the greatest thing – that it, you know, it's the greatest sport that you can do, in my opinion, in terms of what it teaches you, right? Martial arts, all martial arts does. But for me, judo is so hands-on. You know, it really humbles people. It makes you, it, te- it taught me everything I needed to know in life on how to succeed. And, and I owe everything I am today to the sport of judo, without question. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. So, so that's, uh, that's exciting, man. Uh, I'm, I'm pumped. I want to be a part of it. You know, I already am a part of it. But yeah, one team, one dream. That's beautiful, right? So that's uh, yeah, that's very exciting stuff, Jimmy. You know, really, really thank you. Um, any other things that you want to? So people could go to American Judo System right now and sign up and all this stuff. Yeah, well, I, we I, mean, have I know, but usajudo.com is the URL. We purchased the URL. Uh, we get the American Judo System trademarked. Uh, we're nice. doing it as professional as we can. Um, we only do it three hours a week. Travis and I go and shoot three hours on a Friday. Yeah. Every Friday nice. we shoot three hours. We upload content. We're doing yeah. live classes every two weeks. Every two weeks on a awesome. Sunday, one of us does a live class. Everybody gets yep. to ask questions. Um, you know, We'll answer your questions about judo, show you how to do whatever technique or whatever problem you're trying to solve. We're, we're there to help and support. Um, you know, eventually, we're going to get into, ideally get into having a promotion system online where you can earn your judo rank, send us your videos. We'll give you yeah. feedback, that sort of thing. Uh, nice. Run our coaches certifications in the country through this, this platform as well. Uh, ideally, you know, have everything from, from A to Z for the sport of judo. Uh, yeah. The other thing we want to get into is events. I mean, the other big part of this is, is marketing our sport properly. And yep. we're either going to look at an event center where we put on our own events all the time here in the new England mm. market, or, we also get into this special event business. We're just going to showcase live judo events all yeah. the time where we have our young kids in this country showcasing their skills on camera so people can really see what, what real judo looks like. Are you uh, still doing Jimmy Pedro's judo challenge? I am, yes. So nice. When is that? It, it, it's usually every March, but this year, obviously, I couldn't, I couldn't get the gym for this March, right? COVID yeah. wasn't over yet. Nothing had opened yeah. up. But usually it's every March. It's a great tournament. We usually have about 500 competitors that come to the event. Uh, I try to run it as, as professionally as possible. Get in, get out, have time, start times for certain ages. You know, yep. seniors don't need to be there till one o'clock in the afternoon. Yep. You know, the kids get in there, fight early, and go home. Yeah. Um, you, you know, had six mats running, I think, last time I was there, right? 
Yeah, six full uh, mat areas. It's at a beautiful facility, a high school I went to, St. John's Prep High School. It's a beautiful facility. Um, nice. You know, we bring in, you know, try to bring in the best refs we can. But we're all about competition. Like, if, in fairness, if something goes wrong and nobody can decide, go fight again. We don't care. We just want the, we want the right person to win the match. We want everybody to get lots of fights. You yep. know, you can move Love around that. your divisions. We're very flexible with the way we do our brackets. So, uh, try to make it an athlete friendly event. Love that. Love that. And it's March. And hope, yeah. Probably March 2022 will be the time we'll be able to, to run it. Nice. Nice. Cool. That sounds great. Anything else you want to plug? Thank you so much for being on this. Uh, anything else? Find I just you appreciate- on Instagram, send you personal emails and messages <laughs> all, all hours of the night. Right? Just what don't are you do face- <laughs> Jimmy Pedro doesn't do Facebook. I'm not a Facebook guy. So <laughs> you can reach me on Instagram, Jimmy Pedro USA. Uh, I run a, a, my own company as Fujimats.com. I'm also part owner of Fujisports.com. I mean, we're doing some great things in the marketplace that to build the community, you know, and, and I've always been about helping people. You know, it's not about profits. It's not about how much we're doing in sales. It's really about helping people uh, live their dream, right? And that's and that's mm. building a dojo, that's helping them with equipment, that's helping their athletes get to events, making it a, you know, a coach and athlete friendly environment. And, you know, I've I've hired at our at the companies I own, you know, I've hired all my past black belts, my past students. Like if you look at mm. the staff that I have, you know, at both companies, a lot of the guys train jiu-jitsu, train judo, coach, mm. run schools. Like we're yeah. involved. We're martial artists, right? So we know yep. what, what our customers are going through and we want to help support them and, and, and grow their businesses together. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it, Shintaro.